I'm Adam McKinnon and I'm the Education Coordinator here at the Sapelo Island National Estuarine Research Reserve. And where we are here now is in our lab. So we'll bring in school groups uh, from basically fifth grade up to the university level. And this is where we have all these microscopes and uh, stereoscopes where we can do investigations of the national environment of Sapelo Island. And here is, is kind of one of our example of our great hands-on areas where we can go anything from more invasive species that we have here going up through you know, our invertebrates. And then just let them actually physically hold things like this, like a manatee rib. And you just don't get a good impression of what this is until you actually physically have it in your hand. And it's a very robust, stiff um, rib here that, that actually the Wallys used to use as a war club. But, uh, you know, it's essential for regulating a manatees in a water column because they're eating nothing but grass. And we even have things like, you know, leatherback sea turtles, which have nests on the and pass, where the loggerheads are primarily nester here, go about 350 pounds. This guy can go almost too close to a ton. A very deep sea diver, one of the top five deepest diving animals in the world, diving in excess of 2,000 meters. To things like Kips Ridley's, which we see on our beaches sometimes, one of the most critically endangered sea turtles in the world. Or our loggerheads, which, you know, will get maybe 50 nests in a year, starting in about May. And it'll mess on Sapo until about August. So if you're lucky to come out and see one of these guys or these gals coming up in the middle of the night, it's really a quite impressive sight. It's kind of like a National Geographic moment, but I guess now it's more like a Discovery Channel moment. Or even things like this is a pygmy sperm whale, which lives offshore, but is very common as far as uh, washing up on our beaches. One of the deepest diving animals in the world searching for deep sea squids. Of course, you know, like our local residents here, you know, people coming out will get the opportunity to see things like alligators, which were once hunted to almost extinction. And one is our great uh, survival success stories as far as conservation efforts to, to restore those species back to uh, where it is today. What is it? One of the things we're faced with now in Georgia is an is a increasing number of invasive species, which basically means it's an animal that's not native to Georgia, but it's competing with our native wildlife. Uh, and this is one of the examples. This is called a Titan acorn barnacle. And you'll find these commonly on, uh, on buoys and stuff that are washing up on the beaches of Sapo, and it's competing with our native barnacles. And these are large enough to be actually used as uh, a shot glasses for a lot of locals here. And this is uh, one of the green mussels. You find these a lot in uh, oriental restaurants. It comes in ballast water. You know, when ships regulate, when they have cargo, they're, they're very balanced in the water, but if they unload cargo and coming across, they need to take up water to balance the ship. And when they dump the ballast water, you get all sorts of new invaders like this uh, green mussel invading our coast. And of course you have things that aren't really invaders, but are each equally kind of cool stories. This is like a sea heart. This is um, a sea bean. You know, it's a uh, these are grow in the canopies, uh, places like Costa Rica and Brazil, and hit the water, flush out through the rivers, and actually find their way up to Sepal Island thousands of miles away. So this is a very interesting story of how uh, this little bean can float for so long and kind of wash up uh, on the coast. And you can actually polish them up and make pretty cool jewelry out of these things. Ever seen one of these? Head first down or something. Yeah. It recognizes it as an oyster. Yeah. It's just stable. So maybe they can back on food. Yeah. An oyster so it'll it'll back up. It'll grow up. So one of the things we're very privileged to have down in, uh, in Georgia off our coast is the North Atlantic right whale. And this is the most critically endangered whale on the planet. 
there's less than 400 of these animals in the population. That includes all the females, all the males and juveniles. And they'll come down here with the sole purpose of giving birth to their calves. Now, normally they're up in the Bay of Fundy, Stillwagon Banks area, Cape Cod area, where they're feeding exclusively on like copepods and very microscopic planktons and krills. So when they come down here to give birth, they come down here because in the wintertime, with being on that continental shelf here, the water stays relatively cold here in the wintertime, and there's no predators like killer whales or false killer whales to attack their calves, so they can come down here in peace. So starting in about December and up to about, uh, about April, females are down here calving. And it's the only place in the world it happens. It happens from basically the southern tip of South Carolina and, and North Florida. So if you're fortunate to see one, you can see this North Atlantic right whale. The reason it's so critically endangered is that it's called the, the right whale because it was the right whale to kill. So the hunters that would to hunt these whales, they hunt it for the extreme amounts of, of oil and blubber they had because that was how people lit their homes and heated their homes in, the, in, in earlier times. They'd come down in here, they'd kill these adult females, these pregnant females, because they're loaded with it. And, you know, the females, they don't feed the whole time we're down here, so they have to come down here or fully stocked with blubber in order to pass on, you know, good milk generation for the calves. And along about halfway through the season, you know, she's starting to get real skinny and the, the calves are starting to get bigger. Uh, so halfway through, they'd switch over to killing the calves because they're the ones that were increasing the oil in the blubber. So that's why they were just hunted to virtual extinction. So I said, if you're very, very privileged, you can come down here and see this North Atlantic right whale right off of Sapo Island. We spent a lot of time um, researching this animal. We actually have about four aircraft up any given day searching it for signs of this animal to see how well they're, they're breeding, if they've been hit by boats, because that's their number one source of mortality right now, and also if they're entangled in lobster gear. They have to go through a gauntlet of, of fisheries coming down the coast. Uh, and they come down tied up with, with all sorts of ropes and, and netting. And we have to go out there and physically remove off these animals because every one of them is important to the, the, uh, the gene pool. So as I said, it's an animal species. We devote a lot of time, a lot of money on it. You know, the only places in the world you can see it is right here off of Sapo Island. Cut up and 